give this a go? That sounds good. All right, so I'll, I'm, I'll, I'll do the edit, I'll do a little introduction. So I'm Jason Durr, the United Campus Ministries Campus Minister for La Crosse, Wisconsin. I represent the American Baptist, Presbyterian USA, UCC, UMC, and the Episcopals, and I'm here for anybody who walks in the door. And we are here with the one, the only Mr. Brian McLaurin, who has let me pester him over the years, and he is, that, that pestering has paid off into this conversation where we could talk about these stages of uh, faith development. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Jason. Great to be with you. Uh, I am always so happy whenever I get to speak to people like you involved in campus ministry and even more to uh, college students, because I, I know that a lot of college students face exactly the same problem I did when I was uh, a college student. And that is that I grew up in a religious setting that had given me a certain view of the world and then when I came to university, I'm suddenly presented with a lot more complicated view of the world and a bigger view of the world. And at that point, I'm left with all kinds of questions and doubts. Uh, and I wonder how my Christian identity is going to survive and be changed. And of course, this doesn't just happen to Christians. It happens to Jews and Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus, all sorts of uh, people. In fact, it's probably just a necessary stage of growing up, right? As uh, young adolescents, we inherit a whole set of things from our parents. And part of what coming of age is about is sorting through what that we inherited do we want to keep, what do we want to let go of, and so on. Well, one of the things I've said to students is that part of college is you come in, you throw everything on the table, and you walk away. And at some point, you come back, and you're like, well, I like this thing, and I like <laughs> some of this, but not all of it. And that like my job as a campus minister is not to do border patrols around people's faith, but to host yes. the table. Like uh, I provide I love, the table so they, that they can go through that process of questioning and questing and wondering. Oh, and wondering. oh my gosh. Well, you know, I, I know uh, Jason that you're a dad. And of course, I think this is what we could wish parents would do. Um, right. But often parents don't do it or can't do it. And, um, and so thank God for people like you in spaces like this, where people are given permission, just as you say, to do what they need to do to grow up. And uh, so I, I'm always eager to talk to people in that setting. I should also say, I feel the same uh, kind of interest and empathy from the other side. People who grow up without any kind of faith or spirituality, and then they come to college and they, they meet people who do have various kinds of faith and spirituality. And they're trying to figure out, you know, which, what of this do I want and, and how do I bring it on board and, and so on. So um, as I look back on my own struggles in this uh, long ago, and as I was a pastor for 24 years in a university town, helping students, graduate students, faculty wrestle through all of these kinds of uh uh, issues, um, I started to develop what I call a schema of four stages of faith development. And I'd like to just share it because I have a feeling this could be useful for you and useful maybe for your students as well. Um, and I, I should say, uh, as any good student would want, especially graduate student, they'd be interested in me showing my work and giving my sources. And um, I actually have a book on this coming out soon. It's called Faith After Doubt. And uh, in there, I basically take a whole range of uh, theorists, um, you know, from people like Søren Kierkegaard and William Blake, both of whom back in the 1900s had, a stage, had stages of development, to 20th century folks from Sigmund Freud and Jean uh, Piaget, all the way up to people like Ken Wilber more recently, all of whom have various stages of faith development. Um, all the ones I just mentioned were white and male. Um, there's also a whole set of fascinating literature called racial identity theory. And what's very interesting is when, when uh, scholars of racial identity theory talk about how people come to understand their racial identity, very similar stages. And, and then a whole group of uh, feminist uh, scholars critiqued a lot of the work of the first generations of uh, human developmental scholars, almost all of whom were men, 
And, and so I, what I try to do is listen to and integrate all those different voices and then simplify it down into these four. And I actually sneak in a secret fifth um, stage. So let me just run through them real simply. And it's the kind of thing that if in, in, in 20 minutes, uh, we can give people a tool that they could use for the rest of their lives. OK, so here are, here are the four stages. First is simplicity. In simplicity, everything is black and white. Everything is in or out. Everything is us or them. In other words, this is the stage of dualism. And, and this is uh, you would, what you'd expect. A child grows up in a family with a group of respected elders uh, and um, a sense of who we are and also a sense of who they are. And in that world of us and them, we would expect people to be, uh, to be uh, dualistic. And, and one of the sort of axioms of stage one simplicity is uh, that same is safe and different is dangerous. Hmm. Uh, and so simplicity, I'll call it the stage of dualism. Everything goes into us, them, safe, dangerous, good, bad, familiar, unfamiliar categories. Um, for the, 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 let's say the Christian kid, and this would be true in people, different backgrounds, but for the Christian kid, goes up, go, grows up going to Lutheran church or Episcopal church or Baptist church, whatever, they come to college and they go into a class and suddenly things are said that seem to be contradictions of what they were brought up with. Um, and now this causes real tension. It's called cognitive dissonance. How do I hold these two contrary ideas uh, in my mind? And I would guess that that resonates with what you see a lot. Yeah, definitely. Well, let me just uh, pull a second. This is uh, Park Hunter who's just joined us. He's the uh, Methodist minister, one of the Methodist ministers in town. And his wife was my predecessor in my job. So thank you, Park. Oh, that's for great. Sure. Hi, Brian. Thanks for doing hey, this today. Such pleasure to have you. I'll be interested in your comments uh, and, and input as we go along. Okay. Um, go uh, so that's simplicity. Uh, I want to move right on to the second stage, because I think almost all students, I would say 60 to 70 percent at least, and in some places it would be upward of 80 percent of students come in in the stage of simplicity. Um, uh, but very often by the end of freshman year, uh, especially the students who aren't partying too hard, right? So that they're actually paying attention. Um, uh, they will move into a second stage that I call complexity. This is exactly what you'd expect. You come in with two categories, us, them, good, evil, right, wrong, at, uh, at black, white. And in complexity, we come into this to the gray scale, um, to shades of gray. Uh, and this happens in a number of different ways. But one of the ways it happens is just the way modern universities are set up. Uh, you go to biology class and you see the world in the categories of biology. You go to physics class, totally very, very different set of, uh, of categories in physics. Yes, they both use the scientific method to a degree, but they see the world very, very differently. They're looking for different kinds of relationships. And, and so the student says, oh, it's not a matter that biology is right and physics is wrong. It's a matter that each of them is like a game and they each have their own rules of the game. And my job is to figure out when I'm in biology class, how to play by the rules of biology game and in physics class to play the physics game and in history class to pay, play the history game and in English class to play the literature game. And you start to see all these complex games. And at that point, when I'm home with mom and dad, I have to play the family game. And when I'm at church, I have to play the church game. And so that's why I call stage one simplicity. And I would call stage two, um, uh, and I would call simplicity dualistic. And I would call complexity pragmatic. Because the, the, the goal now is success. How do I get an A? Or at least how do I not flunk, <laughs> right? Uh, and how do I play these multiple games? And then you add what else is often going on in a person's life. They're trying to figure out their sexual identity. They're trying to figure out, am I going to be a success in the dating game or in the sexuality game? And am I going to be success when it comes to getting a career? And so the stage two complexity uh, faces us with a whole different set of challenges. In stage one, when, uh, when young uh, people are looking for an authority figure, 
They look for someone who will clearly and confidently tell them what's right and what's wrong, what's truth and what's error. But uh, in stage two in complexity, you're looking for an authority figure who can help you figure it out by yourself. Uh, I, I remember the first time I encountered this in a religious setting, I was invited to this campus ministry group and, I, and there was a big argument about something called free will versus predestination. A lot of folks maybe have never heard of that. Other folks are sick, to, sick of it, right? But this debate was going on. And I remember I went to this campus leader who I really respected and I said, this is typical stage one simplicity question. Who's right on free will versus predestination? I said, who do you think is right? Um, I was enough into complexity that I wasn't saying whatever he thought I would think, but I want to know what he thought. And here's what he said. You know, there are actually four or five different views on that. And then he started telling me what the different views were. And then he basically said, so I think all those are legitimate. You know, uh, I think you make your choice between those. Well, I just remember thinking that's the kind of teacher I want. Someone who doesn't demand that I agree with them, but gives me data in a complex world that helps me live and make uh, uh, decisions and make a success uh, for my own life. Does that resonate? Does that make sense? Very much so, very much so. I, um, I, I tell students that part of my job is to curate a space. I'm a curator, like I'm, I'm, I play host. Like I can't tell people, like, like I said, I don't do border patrols around people's theology. Like we create the space, we journey together, we have the conversation, but like, you know, I have lots of books. I can go show people stuff from all my great books. Um, I've yes. got some of yours here, Brian. But like at the end of the day, it's a conversation. It's a journey. And yeah. yeah. Exactly right. And, and so you become the kind of leader who wants to help people think for themselves. And that's what stage two people are looking for uh, to, a great, to a great degree. Now, I would say that in the United States, uh, a lot of people you know, grow up in stage one and stay in stage one through their whole lives. They may make a brief foray, foray into stage two in their college years, but then they'll revert back to stage one. And, and you know, we certainly see this in election year where you meet Democrats or Republicans who really haven't ever had a political thought of their own. It just depends on which cable news station they listen to and they just recite back what they hear from somebody else. Um, you know, at stage one is a very comfortable, easy place to be. They're just looking for someone who can, they can subcontract out their thinking for them. Um, but in stage two, this complexity grows. And I think that um, increasing numbers of Americans would be, uh, stay in stage two their whole lives. Um, but I think some people are eventually are driven out of stage two into what I would call stage three. And stage three is what I would call uh, perplexity. Um, and if stage one is dualistic and stage two is pragmatic, I would call stage three relativistic. Because what happens in stage three is I step back and I say, there are all these different games going on. Um, and some of these games claim to be right and authoritative, but now I realize they're just another game. And, uh, and I think two things very often drive people into stage three. Oh, actually three things drive people. Um, my friend Richard Rohr says great pain. Um, so, you know, you're a Catholic and, you, uh, you're, and your priest uh, tries to molest you or succeeds in molesting you, assaults you in some way. Well, now it's not just that you've been assaulted, but that this whole religious structure that you trusted has proven to betray you, right? Or you learn that bishops then protected that priest rather than uh, dealt with them, you know, in an appropriate way. When your authority structures are, are shattered and when those people you thought were good don't just turn out to be playing a game, but they actually turn out to be evil in some way, right? Um, uh, this, this disturbs you. Great, great pain, great disruption, great experience of injustice makes you see through things. Now, in stage two, you aren't trying to see through things. You're just trying to see what the rules of the game are. But when you start seeing through the rules of the game, you see, this is a game where people exploit other people and use other people. So great pain, great injustice does it. I think 
a, a liberal arts education and a graduate degree often does it. Because when you study the liberal arts, for example, I was a lit major. You know, I read a book. I remember I read the great novel by uh, Chaim Potok, uh, My Name is Asher Lev. I, did, I grew up fundamentalist Christian. I never grew up, uh, you know, hyper-Orthodox Jew. Um, but this Asher Lev, who grows up in a, you know, what we might call an extreme Orthodox family, as I read that book, I felt like I was given a window into someone else's experience. Or I read the novel just a few years ago, The Kite Runner. I had no way of knowing what it was like to live in Afghanistan. But through that book, I, I'm brought into an Afghan family's uh, life and pain and tragedy and experience. And I start to see the world through someone else's points of, uh, point of view. And at that point, my own point of view isn't the only one I hold. In, in a sense, in my own body and in my own mind, I start to be able to hold multiple points of view, see the world from other people's perspectives, and the world stops being so simple. Um, and in perplexity, then, I move to a, stand, a stance of relativism where I start saying all the people's truth of stage one and all the people's games of stage two, none of them are absolute. And in a certain sense, I can see through everything. Um, and um, you might say, if, if the great danger of stage one simplicity is naivete, uh, and the great danger of stage two complexity is superficiality, you might say the great danger of stage three is cynicism, because I start to see through everything, and it feels like all meaning evaporates, and life just feels like something crass and brute with no dignity or great value. It, everything is debased in some way or, or hollowed out or made empty. And, and I think there's a percentage of people uh, who uh, come into that stage. Most often, I think, um, they come into it, I said, through great painter and justice, through uh, liberal arts education. It can also happen through travel, but it also can happen through graduate school. <laughs> because in graduate school, um, what happens is we go behind the textbooks and we go to the primary sources and we start to see that among the primary sources, every idea is contested. Virtually every idea is contested and everything has an antecedent. And uh, in other words, everything is part of an ongoing argument. And, and that sense that we lose all sense of what's right, what's wrong, what's meaningful, what's meaningless, the feeling that all meaning is slipping through our finger, fingers. There, there's a sense that this is a great enlightenment, right? We're seeing, but there's also a sense of loss and pain uh, in the struggle. So that would be stage three. And I would imagine that you would encounter some students in that stage and that some students would say, yeah, you know, I go to bed some nights and I fall asleep because that's exactly what's happening to me. Does yeah, that, does that ring true? Oh, definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, and that I think is, uh, it, it, ironically, it's the stage that many of the professors are actually in and they're just trying to make a living teaching what they know. Um, but, you know, if a student were to actually come to them and say, is there any meaning to all this? You know, they, the, the, that stage three professor is in perplexity about those kinds of questions himself or herself right. and wouldn't have much to say. And I think that there is a, there's a percentage of people now, of, of adults of all ages, even my age and older, who have lived a big part of their life in that place of stage three. We find it easy to see through things, but it, we find it hard to find value, to see any real lasting value or meaning. Um, and I think that there's some group of people in stage three who then do a kind of retreat back into stage one or stage two, because stage three is just too hard to live with. Um, and I think that happens too. In fact, I think that's what cults are. Cult groups find people in the late stages of stage two and in the early stages of stage three, and they offer them sort of a, a, a vacation back into stage one. Um, mm. And that's part of the appeal. And frankly, I think it's part of the appeal of authoritarian political groups like those we see in our country and world um, right. today, too. An absolute, uh, uh, absolutist uh, ideology. Um, now, I would say there's also a number of people, and I think this number is growing. 
um, that live in stage three for a while. They do its work because there's important work to do. And then they become ready for um, what I'm calling stage four, um, which uh, I would call harmony. And if, if I say stage one is, uh, is simplicity is dualistic, complexity is pragmatic, uh, uh, perplexity is relativistic, I would say that harmony is integral. And by integral, I mean, it says, you know what? There are some strengths of simplicity and there's some strengths of complexity and strengths of perplexity. How do I integrate these into a skill set that doesn't leave me feeling bereft and meaningless? It, it, unlike a cult member, I don't want to go back to stage one and get rid of stage two and three. I want to integrate all of these in, in some way that helps me live, helps me make decisions, but also keeps me humble enough that I can keep learning. And, and so that fourth stage of harmony, I think, is a stage beyond dualism. And it's a stage that doesn't put pragmatism as the greatest, what works, how do I get rich, how do I get an A, and doesn't just say seeing through things, thinking critically is the only value. It says, I want to think constructively, I want to think ethically, and, and I want my life to make some kind of a difference. And, um, and so that, those would be four stages that I see uh, at work in people's lives. I said there was also a, a fifth. And, and so let me just add that and then see if there's anything we'd like to talk about together for a couple of minutes. Um, first, I should say that I think if you stay in stage four long enough, harmony becomes your new simplicity. And guess what? Eventually, it will be challenged by a new complexity and a new perplexity and maybe a breakthrough to a new harmony. And my guess is that you go through that cycle again and again in the course of a, of a lifetime until it, once you've been through that cycle a few times, I just think you start to feel like this is just what life is. It's the integration of these four dimensions. And of course, this is a simplification. It's, it's life is way more messy and complicated than that, but like any tool this simplifies. Um, but I said there was one other stage, and I, I would call this stage stage zero. This is the stage where we're all born. And, um, and I would call this the stage of narcissism. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but when you think about, you know, when you have a baby, the baby never wakes up in the middle of the night and thinks, oh, my diaper is, is messy. Um, but I won't cry because I don't want to wake up my parents. They're such good people. They take such good care of me. I want to give them a break for tonight. Uh, uh, it, what's that? I wish my toddler would say that. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. But a, a, an infant or a toddler is incapable of that because it's, it's not that they're being mean. It's they, they just haven't developed any of that, you know, capacity yet. And what you might say is that if simplicity is dualistic, we could say that uh, that uh, that stage zero is just reactive. If I feel angry, I can't help it. I'm going to scream. And if I feel happy, I can't help it. I'm going to laugh. And if I feel hungry, I can't help it. I'm going to cry. And if I feel angry, I can't help it. I'm going to hit or bite or do whatever. It's this reactive mode. And and I want to mention stage zero for two reasons. First. Because any of us who've ever struggled with addiction know that one of the things that addiction does is it sucks us back into that reactive stage. Uh, and, and the biochemical reasons for it, we could sort of hypothesize about. But also, I want to talk mention stage zero, because stage one people tend to feel that they're the best. You know, um, they, they really think they're better than anybody else. Uh, very often. Um, in fact, stage one people think that stage two people have lost something and they think stage three people are a mess and they don't even believe that stage four people are legit. Um, and I think the reason stage one people know they're so important is because every person is born at stage zero and we don't even call them grown up until they reach stage one. Right. Um, and in fact, raising a person involves raising a reactive person into to that level of caring about right and wrong, of having some sense of us and them, that sense of identity and so on. So um, that schema has helped me uh, navigate my own faith 
and help me help other people navigating their own faith. And um, I would hope it could maybe be of help to, uh, to your students too. Definitely. So, so you're talking about, when you're talking about harmony, and, uh, and of course, uh, you know, Wil Wilbur's include and consent uh, comes yes. to mind when yeah. you talk about that. But I keep thinking about this idea, and I was talking to, like I said, I have this random pagan student who has decided to just show up and be part of everything. And he's my yes. one consistent student, and we just kind of, we're going to go yeah. with it. Um, yeah. But I've, I've been talking to him a lot about, because he has a lot of fundamentalist assumptions about Christianity. Yes. So we, we talk a lot about shifting our view from the scientific proposition to a poetic. Yes. And like, what, if we, what if we could hold different categories of knowledge as poems that talk to each other instead of scientific claims that supersede each yes. other? Yes. Yes. And does that dovetail what you're talking it, about? It there? really does. It really does. Because a stage one person is incapable of understanding what you just said. Okay. Um, because all they're thinking about, everything they're framed with, is, is this right or wrong, true or false, right? In, right? in a sense, they need to come to stage two and get a good literature class <laughs> where they learn that there is something called poetry. And, right. and in a sense, what you, you might say it like this. In stage one, I'm worried about facts. In stage two, I'm worried about success. In stage three, I'm worried about uh, uh, critical thinking and being able to not be deceived and think critically and see... It, stage four is when I'm oriented toward meaning. Okay. And, and, and in some ways, in some ways I'm, I find meaning in stage one, um, but I don't even know, I, I maybe haven't suffered enough to even imagine that life could not have meaning. Hmm. Um, and it, it may be that it's only as we move through those stages that we realize that meaning itself is not something that is just a given, you know? Right. There aren't too many four-year-olds running around the playground saying, you know, my life really lacks meaning. <laughs> um, so I need to read a poem to help me find the meaning in life. Um, but you know what? People get a little bit older and they start to find that out. So I think that, I, that, that image of, of the quest for meaning is exactly what people, they maybe get a little taste of it in stage one. <laughs> they can pick the scent up of it in stage two they start to think, boy, that would be nice in stage three, you know? Right. And, and I was thinking about the simplicity uh, of uh, stage one. And uh, one of the thoughts I've had recently is, if you show me Mother Teresa and you show me an atheist doing the same work, their underlying faith is the same, right? Yes. And I see a lot of stage one fundamentalists. If they're yes. Christian, they're New Age, or they're just um, my, my West Coast liberal friends, right? Yes. But they're all operating from the same type of fundamentalism that assumes that uh, knowing the right thing somehow saves us, yes. right? Like, and, this, and that's the whole call-out culture. Um, my wife's cousin loves to do this. She will call out everybody and shut down relationships and cancel people. And there's no uh, relationship, there's no going deep into the conversation. But underneath it is the same kind of faith, right? The underlying faith is still fundamentalism. So how does fundamentalism drive this uh, stage one simplicity? You know, I think when we use the word fundamentalism, we mean a couple of things. We mean dualism, where we're incapable of seeing shades of gray. You're either canceled or you're good. Uh, right. And we're always putting purity tests on people so that we can figure out which category to push them into, right? Um, uh, stage one is interested in authorities who have the right and power uh, you might even say God-given or some inherent right to tell you what's right and wrong. Right. Um, but, but the interesting problem for people in stage one is when a stage one person encounters a stage one, per, uh, 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 let's say of one race or religion or party who encounters a stage one person from another background, um, they, all they can do is fight. Um, because uh, because each of them, their whole assumption that they come to the other uh, is is really uh, only interested in winning or losing. I mean, that's really the problem. So everything is a win-lose. And, and one of the fears of people who are in stage one is if I'm around you, number one, I might be polluted by you if right. you're different. And number two, other people might see me and they would not think I'm pure. And, and when stage one groups are at work, they're always doing, they, they offer a great sense of belonging, but they also keep one another 
under surveillance to see right. if you're staying pure. Right. I mean, I so I I did time at uh, Liberty University as my first attempt at college, and there's a whole book. They have the Liberty Way, right? And it's how and we all policed each other to keep each other pure and truly Christian, right? And that's a whole institution that's operating off of stage one. Yes. And, you know, Jerry Falwell Jr. may have just done an incredible fa favor to all the students of Liberty in terms of their human and moral development, because by his, you know, personal, uh, and I'm not taking any glee or whatever, but, you know, it's a public mess that he's gotten himself into. Um, breaking all the rules that a student would be kicked out for in his own right. private life and maintaining this whole secret private life. Um, what he basically does is for stage one students, then they have to say, I thought he was good. Right. Now I think he was bad. What do, I, what do I do with that? And then they think, well, now I think he was bad, but does that mean I reject everything about him? Um, well, hold it. I think he's bad in what he did sexually, but he really liked Trump and I really like Trump. So does that mean I have to throw Trump out? Can I hold on to Trump? Can I hold on to Christianity and reject this? And and every student is going to have their basic simplicity, uh, you know, kind of like a, yeah, just shaken up like an Etch-a-Sketch or something <laughs> through this. And of course, some will find a way to double down. And, I, and in fact, when I read the response of the university, I thought, oh, okay, they're already trying to tap this thing down, get it back into the old uh, uh, categories. But, you know, this is an important data in their education, watching all of this unfold. Yeah, and it's, it's been interesting. I mean, talk about the, the stages of development. I've been watching my friend group from my Jerry Falwell days. We've all stayed in touch, um, which, which is great. Um, three of us have gone to seminary, and it's you know left, right, and middle it's cr across the theological uh, yes. spectrum. Um, but there are those people who are doubling down on uh, this ritual purity, right? It, it, which yes. is what it is. It's a form of ritual purity, which keeps yes. some people inside and some outside, and says who is real and who isn't. Um, yes. And it it's life crushing, I think. Like I remember being twenty yes. and being there, yes. but I don't want to be twenty again. I don't want to be in that space again, right? Like because ultimately it made me sick yes. uh, spiritually. Yes, yes, it's, and, and you know, if it, and I don't know if it helps Christians to understand this, but I have Muslim friends who tell me about their version of this. And I have Jewish friends who tell me their version. And, and I have secularist friends who tell me about their version. And, and so what we have to realize is this is a struggle of growing up that, that affects us all. And, and maybe I know our time is just about up, but maybe I could just add one last uh, thought. Um, unfortunately, what happens to a lot of folks is they're given a stage one introduction to the Bible and Jesus and Christianity. And then in stage two, they, they feel like they're stretching the limit. And then in stage three, they just think, oh, all that is a bunch of stage one BS, right? And, and, but here's the interesting thing. If people in stage three can detoxify because there's a lot of detox that has to happen from all the stage one and stage two stuff that they're trying to get out of their system. And they can go back and look at the Bible. Here's the thing that any of us who've done this know, I mean, you know this, uh, uh, I know this, um, the same Bible that was imposed upon them as this stage one hammer, you've got to think this way, or the stage two set of five, five easy steps to this or that, right? You find out it has that poetry in it that you were talking about a little while ago. You find out that, you know what, in those same documents, there are messages that say the opposite of what those people told me. Um, I just thought of this the other day. I was asked to preach on the story of, uh, of Esther. And if, if anyone wants to look up the book of Esther in the Hebrew scriptures, read the first chapter. And what you realize is happening there is a revolt, a feminist revolt, and a revolt of sexually non-binary people. And you I'm think, make I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, you, you realize these issues are not new. These issues have been along for a long time where there was a patriarchy, a violent patriarchy dominating over other people. And suddenly that stuff has been there all along. And all I can say is, as somebody who's been at this for a while now, I can tell you, man, does the Bible look way more interesting when you read it outside of those smaller boxes in, in, in a bigger framework. And I finally would just say, and my gosh, 
Jesus is absolutely fascinating, but for a different set of reasons than a lot of us were taught. We were presented with a Jesus whose main function was to die to pay for sins so that we could go to heaven. But if you let Jesus just be a human being, I'm not saying he's not more than that, but if you start by letting him be a human being in a historical context, who's a movement leader against authoritarian and oppressive stage one regimes, right. does he ever look interesting? Yeah. So well, you're he talking about oh. starts by blowing up the boxes. You've heard it said this, but I tell you that. And everybody's like... <laughs> <laughs> exactly right now, i mean to say you have heard it said a stage one person goes yeah tell me what the tradition is but right. then to hear the word but it's like no oh. <laughs> and you know even there it's it but what's so interesting to me about that is at the beginning of that passage in matthew 5 or nearer the beginning jesus says um uh it he says, I have not come to abolish the law and prophets. I haven't come to abolish our tradition, the boxes we were given, mm -hmm. but to fulfill them. And I think what he's saying is, look, I'm not here to wipe those out. It's just that those were step one to help us get to step two, which would help us get to step three. I want to fulfill their intent by helping you get beyond them, build on them to step two and step three and so on. I mean, I think sometimes we see Jesus blowing up those boxes and we assume now we've got the real right answer instead of what Jesus Jesus is initiating as a new process. Yes. Like the process of blowing up the boxes, we're, we're still invited into that. Right? Like it, and you know, that, that work of blowing up the box hasn't stopped. It, it keeps going. You really feel that in, in two ways. Uh, you feel it near the end of the fourth gospel when Jesus says, uh, uh, there are a lot of things I want to tell you, but you're not ready for them yet. Um, but the spirit will guide you into all truth as if to say, look, I'm giving you what you're ready for, but that's not everything. There's still more to come. And then he even goes on to say, uh, greater things will you do than I've done. So he's basically saying, look, I'm not asking you to stop with me. If you're my followers, you're going to keep this process going. Right. So how do we, how do we preach it? Or how do we, the, the, the stages of development, like what does that look like as liturgy? Like what is a curating a space of spiritual growth where we can acknowledge these stages and help people travel through them? Like, what does that look like as a lived worship space, community, prayer life, et cetera? Yeah, well, this is, as you can imagine, Jason, this has been what a huge part of my adult life has been devoted to figuring, figuring that out. And let me just say that if we take this seriously, it will change a lot of the way we do everything. So let me just give an example. Uh, uh, you know, in, in lit, uh, liturgical churches, and I, I am a member of, a, of an Episcopal congregation here where I live, um, we read large passages of the scripture, and then we end by saying, this is the word of the Lord, and then the people say, thanks be to God. Well, you know what? I can't say that that way anymore. Um, because if I read a verse about blessed are those who dash babies' heads against stones, I don't want to then say this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Now, the lectionary doesn't actually include that text. But, um, but my point is, we have to, I think, show reverence for the Bible, but we've got to find some other words to do, to do it. Um, right. And people find various ways of doing this. Some say, Let's listen for the word of the Lord in this text or something like that. They, you know, there are ways that we can do that, but a lot is going to change. Um, but I'll tell you what I think where it could start. Uh, this is why I put a lot of my effort in recent years into how we teach children about the Bible. Um, I think it starts that we stop using the Bible as the answer book and we start inviting children to get into arguments with the Bible. <laughs> um, and I think we also probably start telling children there are parts of the Bible that aren't really suitable for children, <laughs> you know. Uh, and when you get older, we'll explain why. Um, but uh, I think one of the problems of the Christian religion, reduced to sort of a flat stage one, is they make it sound like there are easy answers to everything. And one of our primary teachings, I think, has to be to children at the youngest ages reality is more wonderful and deep and complex and mysterious than any of us know. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be humble. Um, 
That, yeah. that to me, if that becomes, if we can teach that as a stage one absolute, if you will, we need to be humble because life is complex and deep and mysterious. That's a statement that a stage four person can say with absolute confidence, the kind of confidence that a stage one child appreciates. I teach, uh, we have a year long confirmation process in our congregation and almost entirely eighth graders, uh, each of whom have a mentor and they all sit uh, in these sessions every week. Uh, and I emphasize from the start that what we're trying to do is teach you how to think about your faith, not telling you what you have to absolutely memorize. And, yes. uh, and then it's interesting to watch them wrestle with that. And yes. one, of my, one of my favorite sessions, uh, so Methodists have the social principles, uh, which are a uh, big, big chunk of non-binding but thoughtful stuff about how do we live out our faith. And uh, so I share this with them and, uh, uh, and also share, you know, for example, the Ten Commandments with them and say, you know, let's, so we say we believe this stuff, let's, how does that work? Let's pick one. And yeah. they almost always pick, well, well, you can't murder people because that sounds easy. I'm like, well, okay, that sounds great. So what about, uh, you know, soldiers that have to go fight for the country? <laughs> yes, yes. Abortion. Oh, abortion's bad. Well, what if the mom's going to be really sick and die? <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. What about your grandpa and grandma? If they're, you know, in the hospital and they're, on a breathing machine and they're not really conscious anymore is it murder to take them off the breathing machine even if they've said please take me off the breathing machine if i ever get to this yes. and just yes. watching the kids wrestle with that is great <laughs> and and what's so great to me about that uh is that you are in a position then to teach these kids a message beneath all the other messages and that is as as you were saying before jason i'm a curator of this kind of conversation and, and as a spiritual leader, my job is not to tell you don't ask questions. My job is to ask you tougher questions than you've ever asked before to help you grow and move into new territory. My, my first event here at Campus Mystery, I showed uh, Trip Fuller's movie, um, The Road to Edmonds. And he has that line at the end of the movie where we need better questions. Yes. Right? That, that line has stuck with me ever since. Like, yes. That maybe yes. being a leader, a faith leader, is about helping people find good questions, not the answers. I love it. I love it. No, I have a film background, and in writing a script, you have the MacGuffin, right? The thing, the object or information that drives a story. Like a good question is a good MacGuffin that can drive a lot of journeying and conversation and thinking and praying, right? That's well said. Well, you've given me something to think about because I think that is one of our other problems in in the world of religion, but specifically in Christianity today, is what is that driving force? In Christian faith. And, and I think, unfortunately, and this is one of those things that in a stage three way, I think we have to have permission to doubt. A lot of us were presented with the idea that it's just about getting our souls into heaven when we die. And, and we need a better question that drives us forward, uh, moving forward. And of course, I, I don't think that what happens after we die is the primary question of the Bible anyway. But, right. uh, but a whole lot of people have been taught that it was. And and it takes a lot to help them get permission to even consider yes. another possibility. I was, for a I was lot of people. To, oh, go ahead, Jason. I was talking to the, the local rabbi the other day, and uh, we're, we're planning to do one of these Zoom conversations as well. And we were talking about um, how do you hold like us knowing that the point isn't heaven, but knowing that there are people that you're going to be dealing with, and that is their primary driving metaphor. Yes. Yes. And you have to acknowledge it, but also get the, the current underneath the current, so yes. to speak, right? Yes. Yes. Um, and hold those two things together and honor that metaphor that has driven their life so far, but also, as we said, find the better question or find emerging metaphors for people. It's beautiful. And, you know, I, I could imagine if I were talking to a person in a stage one sort of framework who that's what they've been taught, here's what I want to say to them. Listen, your desire to go to heaven is also connected to a desire to be connected to God. And, and God, if God represents to you all that is good and loving and holy, then it, you wanna be connected to everything that's good. And you wanna be in line and in harmony with everything that's good. And, and um, so let's talk about that, you know? Uh, and, and in that way, maybe help them see that at the deepest part of what they're interested in, 
that's already there. Right. And I think this is the challenge in so many of our religious traditions. It's, it's, I see it in that beautiful little parable. Remember Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like a person who found a treasure hidden in a, he, in a field and he went and sold everything he had so he could buy the field. Uh, in other words, it, the, the value of the field is for the treasure that's buried in it. And then right. people start to see, ah, oh, getting to heaven wasn't the important thing. There was a treasure hidden in the middle of that. And that treasure is being connected to and aligned with what is good and right and beautiful. Right. Yeah. I love it. I love yeah. It. Um, I think for a lot of for the folks that, you know, getting to heaven is the thing. That's That goes right back to that dualistic, I just, I, I want to be right. Yes. I have to be right in order to go to heaven. And uh, I, it, what really drives me nuts about that is those some, same folks will say, well, you know, faith is far more important than works. But what they've done is just turned faith into a kind of works. If I'm not believing in the right way, <laughs> believing hard believing enough, then I'm toast. Right. That's right. Well said. One well, thing, well, go ahead. But one thing that Mother Allison and I talked about yesterday is that how the, our ideas of being saved can actually kill spiritual growth. Yes. So we feel like we've achieved something, like we've hit yes. the final, the final of the video game, at the final level, right? We've leveled up. Now everything's okay. <laughs> Instead of doing the Maya Angelou thing of, are you Dr. Angelo? Are you a Christian? Well, not yet, honey, but I will be. Right. That it's a yes. this ongoing journey of becoming something. Yes, that's exactly right. Exactly right. And I'll just tell you, as an old guy of 64, uh, I feel I have more to learn now than I ever have in my life. Like I can just feel the magnitude of how little I know and how much I have to learn. Uh, and uh, oh, my gosh. And, I, you know, part of me is a little disappointed about that. I wish I would have been farther along by now. But part of me thinks, no. I, I wouldn't have it any other way, right? It, it, right. it feels that that feels accurate and right and uh, and motivating. Right. Well, Brian, thank you so much. Um, I think we went a little bit over the time that we had we had talked about. Do um, you have any concluding thoughts you want to give us, or no? Just to say thanks to you, uh, thanks to Reverend Hunter, thanks for. Uh, all the students, to all the students who'd be part of this. And this is important work to help people go through this growth process. And I'm sad that religion has been sort of in the way. Instead of being a, a tour guide to help you along, it's been like somebody locking you in a, in a room. Um, but that's beginning to change. And, and human beings need help in this lifelong process of growth. Sorry, you mentioned like how religion gets in the way. Is that because we've been so closely tied to power? And now that we're, going, we're, we're shifting towards this post-Christian world and we can get into the cracks of society and be with the people in the cracks, are we going to be more, in a better position to help the, in these kind of conversations if we're yeah. not so close to power? Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a huge part of it. Exactly right. Um, exactly right. Yeah. And, and I just think um, people in power are very happy the more stage one people that they have. Right. And they're very happy for the stage two people too. Um, the stage one people obey them and the stage two people want to even, you know, climb the ladder of success that they have control of. Um, the stage three people cause them trouble because they become, they, they see through the game. Right. Uh, so, yeah, there, there's a, a unhealthy relationship when stage one, especially when stage one and stage two people are in charge of religion. Hmm. And Park, do you have any concluding questions you want to ask? Or um, nope, just privileged to pop in here. And uh, uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Brian, thank you so much. I you always let me pick your brain, and I always appreciate it because I'm a very annoying person. So thank you Not for. Uh... <laughs> but thank you for doing this. And like I said, I will put it out to the students and. It kind of goes through the networks and gets to the people it needs to get to. It's a very confusing year for campus ministry, so we just kind of yes. do our best. So, I, well, I do. my heart goes out to you and all the students, and and uh, keep up the great work. And we'll do this again sometime. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Park. Mm -hmm. See you later. <laughs>